go by feet. You are welcome to the Oompa Loompa Cycling. Nice to be here, man. It's a very nice studio. We last spoke almost one year ago. Actually, we didn't last speak one year ago. La. I mean, I interviewed you one year yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah. But so happened you live next to me. We yeah. go out for coffee time. We go out very often for coffee. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> how, do you like, how, like, how do you like the new setup, man? I love it. I think everybody should come here and do an interview. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and, very comfortable. And, and get their bike serviced over and get your bike bicycle service wrench. Set. Yeah. Shane's a good mechanic. I yeah. heard, heard a lot of good things about him, but I've yet to bring my bike over because <laughs> I do my own DIY. But anyway, today we're here to talk about uh, your business because I think the last yeah. time you were here, we only briefly talked about yes, yes. your business. And I didn't know you were running Red White until yeah. you know, we started asking someone, someone did a question like, what do you do for a living? And then you told me a bike industry. That's yeah, how I yeah. No, how I, like, I like to keep it on a low key because like... Uh, the minute I tell people I'm doing something related in the cycling industry, mm. uh, the conversation changes. Mm. So I prefer to uh, not tell people what I, what I do for a living. Yeah. yeah. When you say the conversation changes, like what do people, do they treat you differently? Do you want to try to get free things out of you? No, no. Normally most people don't do that. But they, but, but they start asking me questions about the business, how are things going? And mm. I don't really want to answer those questions because, you know, I'm quite tired of it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I think we got on the sexy light. It's, uh, it's over here. If you don't mind helping me turn on the switch. I just realized that's missing. Yeah, uh, here we go, man. Ding, that's ding, the light. Ding, ding. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, so today we're here just to talk about the business. I think uh, yeah, yeah. I've seen a couple of interviews about you. You did it with Melvin. and then uh, Yeah, I did one with Melvin. Mm. And actually, that's about it. Right. Yeah. Recently, you just sponsored some guy, right? I was just, I was just checking you out. And then I think... Uh, uh, there's this guy in America. I, okay, I do a lot of ad hoc sponsor. So ad hoc sponsor means uh, someone writes into me and they tell me, hey, I'm doing this um, and would you like to support me? And I will look at my monthly budget and yeah, I have the budget this month to support you. So I'll just send a few bribes. And mm. usually I'll, so usually when I sponsor someone, so uh, on an ad hoc basis, I make sure that they have enough bibs for the whole season. So it's not just one piece. It's got to be like, three, four pieces. Mm. So it's enough for one year. I've got to thank you for sponsoring me, so sponsoring me and uh, some of my viewers on the <laughs> last, last bib. Um, but anyway, yeah, let's, let's talk about how the Red White started uh, and why bibs? Um, okay, it started way back in 2014. Uh, I was working uh, for a company. Uh, you know the company that makes um, fans without blades? Mm. Uh, Dyson, yeah. So I worked for them for about a year, a uh, year and a half to two years. And... Um, I was relatively young, I was 26, and I wanted to, um, I was itchy, and I wanted something better for myself. I didn't really want to keep working for someone. So at 26, I just wanted to go out and start a business, and I didn't know what to do. And uh, I happened to go into bib shots because um, I write a lot and I buy a lot of bib shots. Mm -hmm. and. Typically, what I do is I'll go to you know this was before, uh, these were days before Ali, AliExpress, right? There'd be some guy that brings in bibs from China. It's usually a, a team replica, so bibs normally cost like forty-five to fifty sing. So I buy like four of them a year, and it just wears out, right? It's, uh, it's made of the polyester material, just and I have big ties, so my ties rub up against the bike and it just comes holy. So I got tired of it. Then I went out looking for better quality stuff. And uh, back then, so it's 2014, back then, if you wanted something really high quality, you had very few brands, brands to choose from. It's not like today where you have a lot of brands. Uh, back then, you had basically the premium brand was uh, Rafa. Uh, you had Ascaso, Scastelli, and uh, those were in the 200s plus. Hmm. You didn't really have anything in the mid-market range. So I started the brand for that mid-market range. So that's when Red White came out. Mm. Yeah. So, wow. Um, so, you, 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 your background, are you an engineer? I'm an engineer by training. I studied mechanical engineering uh, and uh, I worked as an engineer. Right. Yeah. And this but I'm not an engineer now. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't done engineering for eight years, so, right. I, so I can't claim to be an engineer. Yeah. Um, so, are you, do you, will you consider yourself as one of the, 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 the rather bigger players in Southeast Asia or Asia? Like a homegrown brand? No. Uh, actually, Red Bull is really small. It's just me. Yeah, literally just me. 
Okay, so so I do have I, I do use a lot of uh, leverage. So um, um, my manufacturing is, is contracted out to a, a, a company in Italy, and they work with a network of suppliers across Romania, Hungary, basically the entire EU fabric and manufacturing supply chain, and they put the bib shot together to my specifications. Mm. So. I, so it's kind of it's not really accurate for me to say that I work alone because I work very closely with them and, and it's a fairly large company. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you actually brought some products here for us. If you yeah. could, uh, maybe you want to share some. What are the the lineups that you have here? Okay, so, oh, okay, let me just. Okay. So so, I make only bibs uh, because um, I wanted to keep the company small and I wanted it to be focused on a product that most cyclists need and most cyclists replace every year. Mm. So when you think about, in terms of clothing, the... It's okay. I, I think stuff it's a, remember uh, to subscribe, okay? Then I don't have to hold this up here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, so... If you think about what you replace often as a cyclist, uh, it's going to be socks, usually socks. And the next thing will be bibs. Right, you you will normally rotate at least two pairs a year, and you replace them every a year and a half to two years. Mm. Yeah. So, the strategy for me was I didn't want to do jerseys. I wanted to do this one item that everybody will every need every year, and they replace it on a fairly frequent basis. So, so it's a um, it's fairly highly recurring purchasing, so the business becomes more sustainable. Mm. So that's why I went to bibs mainly. Mm. Uh, that and I wanted something cheaper for myself. But you told me you started off, you did a bit of uh, jerseys as well, right? At one yes, point. yes. So, uh, the, so back, I started in 2014, I started with one product. And sometime in 2016, I wanted to expand. Um, and I came up with um, seven jersey colors, uh, five socks colors, gloves, uh, water bottles. Mm. And I did that for about two years all the way uh, three years actually 2019 what I found out was uh, over those three years right jerseys socks gloves they only made up 20% of sales 80% of sales primarily was this one product that I was uh, selling called the bib and I decided in 2019 to just kill off everything else and just focus way back on bibs it's a, it's a classic 80-20 rule right and it was painful because you basically have to cut out 20% of sales to refocus on one thing. And I think it's a gamble that paid off very well because what it did was it brought uh, the company's uh, cost structure into control. So from an inventory point of view, I just have to stock basically one product and I have to stock like a lot of sizes of it. Mm. And that's it. So from an inventory operational point of view, it simplifies the entire structure. And um, it's only possible really because I'm the only one running the company. So as a one-man operation, um, it's a unique advantage that I have that I can do this. I can build a company this way. Uh, most other brands probably can't because they're, not, they're just not structurally set up to just do one product. Mm. Yeah. But don't you think it's, uh, if, you, if you hire people to do things for you, get a product designer, uh, mm. you can scale up faster rather than doing it a one-man show? The, the issue with scaling is that um, I believe the cycling industry is just too small for a uh, massive scale. So you have, uh, you, you do have the big brands, the early movers that did it. Uh, you have uh, Rafa, one of the first, uh, to bring out the, you know, the non, uh, um, basically the non-team issue kit style. Uh, they started, I believe they started with VC funding or some investor funding, not VC, investor funding. Uh, then I think the Aussie brands, two of them, MAP and, um, what's the other one? <laughs> uh, uh, I think map is bigger uh, yeah. I, I don't know I, I, I don't really look into the numbers but uh, I feel like in Singapore more people wear map mm. as an Australian and the other one is um, Attacker um, I, I used to hear of Attacker a lot mm. uh, nowadays it's the other one uh, Black Sheep Cycling ah, Black Sheep, Black yes. Sheep Cycling yeah, I don't know if Black Sheep Cycling took on investment mm. but I don't know map is map is, is run by two guys that used to work in uh, uh, sportswear or some clothing brand. I, I, may be, I may be confusing but they're quite, quite experienced so when you have, uh, and then you have the, the classic guys, Asos, Castelli, so, they, so these are large companies, they have a lot of products. And as a small brand, you have basically two options. One is you try to fight them head, head on. So you invest a lot in a product development team, hire a lot of people, design a lot of products, go out there. Uh, or you simplify and you just do 
very few things, but you do them really well. Mm. So I chose the latter, uh, but by choosing the latter, you give up a lot of upside, right? You, you give up the choice, uh, the, the, the ability to scale to a massive uh, volume, but on a revenue per employee basis, you're far more efficient, mm. right? So I chose the latter and I'm quite happy with it. And where do you think your main sales in, in terms of geography? You say it's not really Asia, right? Maybe no, no, no. So biggest driver of sales, sixty percent is the US. That's funny, right? Because yep. you are based in Singapore. <laughs> why do you yeah. think it's why do you think it's so? Um, because the US is just a big market. It is it is the single biggest market for cycling anything. Right? You have a population of three hundred sixty million people. Uh, GDP is relatively high. Uh, and they're willing to spend. Mm. Right, so that's going naturally going to be the biggest market. Um, the e, I, I would, I would like the EU to be a big market, it's, but unfortunately for the EU, you have to be an EU brand in the EU. Uh, so you, from a tax perspective, you just don't have the issue of sending it into the EU and then having to deal with VAT and you're able to grow a company faster. Mm. Now, I did think about growing in the EU by having a warehouse in the EU, but the tax complexities of that made it. Uh, just not worth my time for now. I, I do plan to do it at some point, but not now. I'm primarily I'm focused on servicing the US, uh, the Australian, New Zealand, Asian markets. Mm. Yeah, and the EU is, uh, uh, the, I, I think the, the Europeans have a lot of options with a lot of brands. So if they want to buy from Red White, I ship to the EU. Uh, shipping is free. Shipping is free worldwide. You don't pay anything for shipping. Uh, but if you're in the EU, you have to deal with uh, taxes, VAT or import. Yeah. Right. And let's talk about, on the topic of logistics. Uh, yeah. So let me get this straight, right? Fabrics come from Italy, if I'm not wrong? Italian fabrics? Um, okay, so the, so the fabrics are... Okay, so there's a mix of fabrics. I can't reveal exactly where I get it on, but the most obvious fabric is from Miti. Miti is a very... Uh, a lot of companies use them. A lot of Chinese clothing manufacturers use them as well. Um, but Miti fabrics are not made in Italy. If I'm not wrong, they're made, they're milled in Hungary. Mm. And then they're kind of finished off in Italy. I, I may be getting that wrong. Um, but the main raw processing of fabrics happen in Hungary. Mm. So you have a warehouse in Singapore? I have a warehouse in Singapore, yes. And so everything gets uh, delivered here in Singapore and then to the final destination? Yeah, so how my supply chain works is that my, okay, so the pads, uh, my pads are manufactured in Croatia. Uh, and um, so I sent a guy an order, and he, uh, they literally drive a truck all the way to Italy, <laughs> and they deliver to my, prime, my, main con, my main contractor. My main con takes delivery of these pads. I usually do massive volumes. I do a bulk of all of these. And then he sends it to his assembly plant in Romania. I believe he's getting up another one in another Eastern European company, uh, mm. country, so diversified supply chain and all that. Mm. Uh, then he liaises with Mitali, uh, with Miti, and they supply the fabrics, whatever fabrics that I need, they supply it to him, and then he sends it for cutting, stitching, QC, brings it back to Italy from, for QC, and then flies it out to Singapore. Wow. How long does it take to get a beep done from uh, scratch? From order to arriving in my warehouse in Singapore, about three months. Ooh, that's long. Yeah, so my product, my product cycles are relatively long. It's not very good because... Can't do just in time manufacturing. Yeah. Uh, because you know it's all the way in Europe, right? And uh, so okay, so so that's so I kind of play to that supply chain uh, reality. So that's why one product helps. Mm. So I'm able to standardize all my manufacturing of uh, fabrics and it just simplifies everything. So it's so from a you know, three months is sounds like a long time, but it allows me to pre plan very easily in advance. Right. Because it's the product line is very simple. Before we go on to the bib, sorry, I know yeah. you, you took it off for a very long time. Yeah, that's fine. If you don't, I mean, people no, can just go to the website to look yeah, at it. I yeah, I want to talk about that. Maybe just yeah. give the viewers a bit of insight of uh, yeah. what you have. Um, but how does an engineer who worked in Dyson <laughs> for a couple of years come out and start a bib company, right? It's, it, yeah. it sounds easy, but I think it's pretty tough. <laughs> um, okay, I, 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 okay, you don't have to be an engineer to do this. Anyone can. It's clothing, right? It's not, uh, it's not like designing a pair of wheels or hardware where you have to have proper engineering. You have to understand uh, mechanical engineering at least to, to do them well. Uh, I mean, you had Hambini on a channel, Peak, Peak Talk. Uh, I don't think he had... No, I haven't. They're both engineers. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if Peak Talk is an engineer, but he comes off as an engineer. Like, the way he talks is like an engineer. Uh, 
So those really hard skills translate to hard products. But for clothing, it's true, you need some degree of an engineering mind. When you want to do like, um, you want to control like uh, tolerances. Mm. But your tolerances are not going to be like, you know, uh, 0.5 mil. It's going to be like, <laughs> your tolerances are like 0.5 cm. <laughs> right? because, because ultimately you're working with, with people who have to hand stitch stuff together. Yeah. And human being, your hand tolerances, I mean, what you can do is like, what, visually, half a centimeter? Mm. Yeah, so, so you don't need that much in engineering. So it's quite forgiving. Anyone can do this. Um, it's a, it, it does take a lot of work. You have to put in the work to do it, but it's doable. I, I believe anybody can do anything. Were there times where you were like, you know what, F this, I'm going back to the corporate life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not worth my time. It's oh, not worth the money. Many times, many yeah. times, many times, many times. Yeah, yeah. What kept you going? You just didn't want to clock in the nine to five. And <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't want to work for someone, basically. So that's, that's what made me uh, continue. Yeah, I have a lot to say, but uh, my boss might be watching. So, <laughs> 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 my my wife wouldn't approve. So she's like, "No, you stay your job. Don't leave the company." Yeah. The, okay. So, so the 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 other advantage that I have is when I started the company, I was twenty six. I was single. Mm. Uh, rent in Singapore back then was cheap, right? Yeah. Tell me about it, man. Yeah, like I was renting a room for uh, you know six hundred bucks. Yeah. Now it's like what eight hundred thousand. Uh, so from a, from a risk perspective You know I didn't have obligations My overheads were quite low So it was It was the perfect time To start a company mm. Yeah Perfect time to take Maximum risk I probably can't do it now I've got a wife I've got a house Damn yeah. it <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bit too late To the game <laughs> Yeah 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 but, uh, that, No but that That being said I, I think I think if uh, I, I, I do think I do think I really believe I do think more people Should start businesses Mm. Uh, because if you don't start a business, right, you never, you do not give yourself the chance of that upside, yeah, mm. that potential upside. But you can definitely de-risk it. But I think you got to have passion in what you do. You can't just like, you know, what I just want to make money. I don't know for someone. I'm just going to um, start selling things. I think passion is uh, important to some extent, but more importantly, you, uh, you need to work on something where there's a tangible market for it, mm. right? Uh, you, basically, whatever you do has whatever you do has to have a high percentage or chance of success. So therefore, you need to go after a decently sized market. You can't mm. just, you know. So when I started this company, right, I was very naive, right. If you go back to uh, if I'd known just how competitive it was, how uh, tough it was, how difficult it would be to scale, and I decided not to scale, uh, I would not have started a cycling clothing company. But you know, what would you have done differently then? What would you have done? Um. This was 2014. Uh, 2014, the opportunity was actually in software. Software? Yeah. Is it a software? Or, yeah, software. But you wouldn't need the technical skills for that, right? I was an engineer, right? It's, oh, yeah, okay. I, I, I understood the software code okay. programming. I understood Python and C++. So, wow. okay. so it would have been possible to do something in software, mm. yeah. Okay, let's come back to the BIPs. Uh, what, what do you have here, man? Like, what, what's the current lineup in the... Okay, so Red White... At the core, eighty percent of product is uh, sales. Just one product, and that is something called the bib. And the bib has over the over the last years, it's, it's come in various formats, colors, uh, way it looks. But essentially, all of them look like this. Uh, basically, a black pair of bibs and uh, with a red pad inside. Mm, mm. And um, so that's eighty percent of sales. And around that, so this is the main platform, so to speak, the main product. And then on this, there are variations of other products. There is a version of this with pockets called the cargo bib. Right? Basically this, but with pockets. Yeah. Uh, there's some tweaks uh, for the pattern so that I can actually put pockets on it. But it's more or less the same thing. Mm. Uh, so if you like the bib, you are going to buy a cargo bib and it's going to be like a, a direct translation, mm. right? There will be some minor uh, changes in fit because the cargo bib has got a pocket and the pocket adds some, you know, it's, it's not as easy to slip into as this because it's a pocket, right? Mm. But um, I've designed it in such a way that if you're like an L in this and you on the edge of an L size, you have to go up on XL, you're, you're going to get more or less the same experience with XL. Mm. So it's like, so you're not going to a product that's too far different. Then I have a three-quarter version of this. So basically this with like three-quarter extra legs. Yeah. Then I have a full-length one with, that's made for winter, uh, which I don't really market much of, uh, and, but it's an incredibly underrated product and anybody I sell it to just loves it. Mm. Yeah. So these are the main ones. And all of them use uh, the same pad. Yes. Right. I do have one version. I didn't bring it here. It's called the entry bib shot. Yeah. So it's nothing like this. Oh, okay, it's something like this, the same pattern, mm. same pattern, same fit, but the fabrics are cheaper. 
Mm. Yeah, and that's just to hit a particular price point for for people who don't need uh, to ride ultra distance. Right. So, so, so like, you, 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 your selling point is the beep that will bring the rider for a longer distance. They yes. won't feel. Yes. So most customers that use red white apparel, okay, I, I can't say most customers, but uh, the people that get the most out of it, the people who talk to me, leave reviews, who specifically buy it, uh, mainly Audex riders, uh, ultra distance riders, guys who do like Paris Press Paris, uh, transcontinental race, things like that, uh, they come to me and they buy this. Mm. Yep. And my, the, the brand is always focused on serving that customer. And the idea is that if it's good enough for them, it's going to be good enough for most people. And you don't, have, you don't, you don't put this out at retail stores, at bike shops? I used to, I used to have, a, a, I used to retail. So, you know, back in 2014, I, I tried a lot of things. I tried a lot of things. So one of the things I tried was uh, I tried to go the retailer dealer route. So I had uh, one uh, large, I had one retailer in Singapore. Uh, Velo Velo used to sell. Uh, then I had a few more retailers. Then um, in Australia, I had one or two. In the US, I had one. In Japan, I had one. What I found out from the retail model was that, um, with, with, ex- with the exception of Velo Velo, which, are, which are, I mean, Velo Velo is really good. The, the guy who runs it, uh, Jonathan, he's, uh, he's very customer centric. So, so he's the exception. Uh, but ultimately, I decided to pull out from retailers because uh, I'd realized that. Uh, I have the ability to service customers directly from Singapore, anywhere in the world, mm. right? And I, by pulling away from retailers, I have complete control over pricing. I have complete control over inventory. So I don't have to worry about inventory at the retailers. Every, all inventory is stored at my warehouse. Uh, and most importantly, I can give every customer that buys a consistent customer experience. Mm. So... You don't have to go to a retail a dealer and if the dealer is subpar, uh, you get a bad experience. You're going to get from me and more often than not, you're going to get a better service. But like, I'm, I'm a cyclist, right? Yeah. And I like to visit the shop, have yep. a look for myself, what it looks like, have a feel of it, yep. then make the purchase. Yeah. Um, don't you think that will work? It is important. Unfortunately, it just costs a lot of money. It's costly. Yeah, because if you want to, if you want to think about uh, so you, you want to think about putting your product out and, get, and into a network of dealers where people can just come to a shop and touch and feel it. Uh, it's expensive because you, first of all, I need, to, I need to produce a lot of inventory to supply the shops directly. Then I need to build a network of dealers who want to even stock the product in the first place. The issue with cycling clothing is that when, I've, when I talk to dealers in, um, well, it's not Singapore. Singapore is a small market, so I can go to them directly. Uh, the US, for example, right? Most dealers prefer to buy from very big uh, distributors. And if you're not in the distributor, you're not going to get to the dealers because the, because the distributor basically stocks a lot of it. And then the dealer comes and it buys from the distributor and, and that's their supply chain, right? So I tried for a while to, to get into uh, distributors in the US, uh, but it was not easy. Yeah, mm. because they have a lot of relationships with uh, with existing suppliers. Mm. Yeah, and and if they're committed to a particular brand, there's no reason for them to stock up yet another brand, even though you know. Okay, I truly believe it's a superior product at a at a most at a superior price point, it's 140 bucks, uh, US, and uh, not a lot of companies produce products that hit that price point for this specification. Mm. Yeah, and but yeah, but but ultimately, if the distributor doesn't want to stock it, you know. I have to do it myself. Yeah. yeah. And buying process. Uh, so people go online, there's a sizing guide. Yeah. So, I, so the ideal process is what you do is, uh, I do have a sizing chart. I recommend people to, to not use it. <laughs> oh, why? Uh, because I have something called a red-white sizing help desk. So basically, you come to the sizing help desk, you give me your height and weight. Uh, then based on the height and weight, I can make a solid recommendation for you. Usually what happens is, if you're like... Um, uh, most people, half of people, I get odd sizing. So you can have a guy who's 170 cm tall, 5'7", foot foot and then he is uh, 80 kilos. So 80 kilos is what, 190 pounds? Uh, I'm translating for the US audience, you're watching this, 180 pounds. So the issue with the customer like that is when I see it, right, I know that probably nothing's going to fit. So then I can tell you, don't buy anything. Mm. Right? It's not going to fit you because at 80 kilos and 5'7", and you, you're going to need an XL. Right? But Excel is going to be too long for you. Mm. Uh, and 
one, so I started doing that, and over three years, I just kept telling people, sorry, can't, you, um, he came in with really odd size, you can't buy, I'm sorry, you can't buy, you can't buy. Mm. The advantage of that was uh, I managed to get enough data to release a variant of the VIP shot that is 5cm shorter. For, so now the guy who's like 170, 80 kilo can buy an XL, but it's 5cm shorter, so it'll fit in. Mm. So for me, uh, I do want people to go through the sizing help desk because they get a better experience, and more importantly, they, they get the right size. Mm. And they don't end up having to return something or, or it doesn't fit. And then they, they kind of live. Because some customers just live with it, right? They, mm. they don't want to go through the hassle of returning something. So you use the sizing help desk. It's free. Uh, you get to talk to me. I may, and I'll make a solid recommendation for you. And if I get it wrong, I will uh, usually I'll just uh, pay for a return. Mm. Yeah. Uh, you say you're a one-man show. So you manage the hotline, hot manage desk. everything, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everything, yeah. Everything into it, man. Yeah, but no, but it's all about streamlining, right? So I don't have a phone number. Uh, because people like to text. No one likes to call. Uh, it's uh, two ways of communication. Uh, WhatsApp, comes straight to my phone. Sorry, three ways. WhatsApp, comes straight to my phone. There's a chat function on the website. Comes straight to my phone. And sizing help desk email. Comes straight to my phone. So it's like a one command yeah. center for me. Very personal. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. So uh, I've got a couple of questions on sure, uh, sure, IG sure, from my sure. followers. Uh, from QX from Ascend Bikes. Mm. Another Singaporean uh, entrepreneur. Hey. who was recently on my show, yes. he says, it's nice to see another Singapore entrepreneur in the cycling space who designs their own stuff. Kudos. Thank you. Thank you. It's quite, <laughs> it's quite flattering, actually. Though, though I have to say that I did not design... Every, oh, sure, I did design a lot of it, but uh, you have to have good manufacturing partners who can... Uh, sometimes you make, a, you make a suggestion or design change, but then they will tell you, right, okay, you can do this, but when you manufacture 5,000 pieces of it, you're going to get an error rate of this much, so you're going to get this many rejects. Mm. So it's not a good idea to do it that way. And, and how, how often do you uh, update your design? Do you normally do it or it's usually the same? My update cycle is very long. So when I release a product, normally I don't change it for at least four years, four or five years. So right now, so right now what, you're, what you're seeing here is a 2023 model. Mm. I started designing this in 2021. So for two years, I basically uh, went through... Um, a lot of suppliers looking for the right fabrics to swap it out. And the only reason I change things is when I have time to gather a critical amount of data from customers that tells me that, okay, this item needs to be changed. Mm -hmm. So, because, because when you change something on something that a lot of people like, you're going to piss people off, right? Some people who like a particular style, particular fit, when you change it, they're like, oh, you know what? I don't like this. <laughs> so I have to, I have to, uh, I find that as the brand grows, I have to make sure that when I make, when I roll a change, right, the older customers like it. But how do you innovate though? Like how, how do you like keep getting new things, new buyers coming in? Um, I or do you just stick to what you have? Cycling and... clothing, you don't have to, uh, cycling summer bib shorts, you don't have to innovate a lot. Mm. And the reason you don't have to innovate a lot is I, I believe that the innovation cycle is not as fast or as rapid as most industries. Mm. So, for example, if you think of uh, the last great innovation in cycling bib shots in the last 20 years, right? Uh, three, basically, three, three things changed. The first thing that changed was uh, you get better quality pads, right? Uh, specifically, multi-density pads. So, if you see a red white, it's got... Um, a minimum four layers and it's contoured it's shaped and it's heat molded so it doesn't like it doesn't fall apart like most pads like 20 years ago mm. innovation number one number two uh, gripper so if you remember when we started cycling 2009 like that you had that silicon brand right and mm. that was like the de facto yeah. go to innovation for donkey years I, I totally forgot about it you yeah. just reminded me about it exactly <laughs> but at some point it disappeared yes it disappeared roughly around 2013 2012 right so when Red White first started, right, we were one of the first to use something called, I called it a silicon micro dot gripper. Basically a piece of Lycra that has got like a lot of small silicon dots on it. Mm. And no one else was using it at the time. Very few companies were using it. And a year after that, everybody's using it. Oh. Yeah. So, yeah. I, so I, be, no, I, don't, I don't think we were transcendent. It just happened to be when I started a company, this new fabric happened to be available and I was willing to take a chance on it. Like, mm. I wanted to take a chance on it because it was just superior. Mm. The other thing that changed over the last few years is that Lycra, the quality of Lycra these days is just so much better. Mm. So, um, 
Yeah, three things and you know fabrics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, next, next one. Um, only bibs. Other accessories like matchy socks. Uh, I perhaps? think the answer to the question is socks, right? Okay, so I used to do socks. I used mm. to do gloves. I used to do jerseys. I used to do caps. The whole suite. I used to do stuff. I used to cross sell. So that was a time when I cross sell uh, products from other companies. Uh, Pedla, Fixo, Australian companies, Stolen Goat, UK company. Basically, it's a. Um, uh, I think BioRacer supplies them. Mm. What I found out from doing all of that it was uh, those things for me was a distraction. The issue with, I mean, let's look at jerseys, for example. Right? The issue with jerseys is that uh, they're incredibly fashion-driven. So if you release something, the jersey could be technically very good, uh, but if the design is not what someone likes, people are just not going to buy it. Mm. Yeah, so you have a double layer of risk, which I didn't want to take on. I mean, I tried it, but what I found was return rates were very high. Yeah, some mm. of sizing is sizing for jerseys is odd because you uh, what uh, the fit preference for a jersey varies for people. Some people like me, I, I believe for you, we like it as tight as possible. Mm. Arrow, arrow, uh, <laughs> one or two sizes smaller. I don't care. Can. <laughs> some people don't like that. Yeah, yeah. So what you so what you get is you, you get people come in right. They look at the sizing chart. They buy something, but it's not to the fit that they want, and they'll then they'll return it. Yeah. Yeah, so I had like 30% return rates on jerseys, so mm. unsustainable, so I stopped doing it. Right. Um, why do you only make bibs for tall people? Uh, good question. I used to make bibs for tall people for a very long time, but that changed based on data that I gathered over the last three years. And now you can buy the same sizes that are two inches shorter, 5 cm shorter. But it's not just five inches shorter. It's five inches short, five, five cm, two inches shorter, mm -hmm. but it's also like tapered properly. Right. So it's just not short, it's also tapered, so it fits your, pro, your I mean, if you're short, then it, it proportionally fits you. Mm. Yeah. What is the average lifespan mileage of your bibs? Um, in general, bibs, uh, okay, my bibs follows most general bibs. Uh, most people, if they rotate two pairs, it's going to last you about a year and a half, a year and a year and a half, max. Mm. If you're a high mileage rider, like 250, 200k a week. Do you have some kind of loyalty program? Like people sign up, they buy one, they get you know, next one or the discount or something like that? I, I used to do something called uh, like, um, so this was way back. All, all, everything I'm saying now is way back 2019, 2018. I used to do where if you come in, uh, your first purchase is 20% off. And then when you come in again, I'll like, give you 20%. What I found out when I did that was that it was value destructive. Meaning I wasn't charging the price that I should be charging to earn sustainable margins to run a sustainable company. Mm. So, and also when you, when you start discounting, um, you devalue the product and somebody, and a customer who buys something at a discount very likely will not buy something at the full price. Also, you, for me personally, I believe that you shortchange other customers who paid full price for something and then someone's boss bought a discount, it's not fair to them. Yeah, that's true. So I made the decision way back in 2019 to go to fixed pricing and to offer something that I call fair pricing all year round. So fair pricing means it's cost of goods sold plus a reasonable margin. Mm. Uh, and a reasonable margin, the idea of reasonable margin, uh, for me, it's lower than most companies because structurally it's just me. So my cost structure is much lower and, and I can earn a reasonable margin that's good for me and it's good for the customer because mm. you know, I'm just one guy. Yeah. Uh, which is why I'm able to price it uh, uh, at 140 US dollars right, and right. offer free shipping by DHL or FedEx worldwide and offer 50% crash replacement and good customer yeah, yeah, yeah. what are some weirdest uh, customers that come to you and tell you about your bibs and complaints maybe complaints you could share some oh every, there's no such thing as a satisfied I mean there's no such thing as a fully satisfied we're all divinely dissatisfied divinely <laughs> dissatis unsatisfied yeah unsatisfied so I do get all sorts of uh, uh, customers that come to me with very special uh, complaints. Special. Uh, special complaints. Uh, but it's the percentage, the raw percentage is 5%. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I believe I have one of the fewest, uh, I can't tell about a brand, but number of customers who are satisfied with products, very high. Mm. Yeah, so oh, also I'm kind of skirting around it because I don't really want to tell cu private customer information. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah for because, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, but most people are happy with it. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll tell in general speaking, uh, customers that are not happy with it, uh, pads too thick, pad is too thin. <laughs> <laughs> Extreme ends. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pad is too, it's, yeah, and it's either too thick and it's too thin. Yeah. Um, it, it used to be that it's too tight, but then you can fix that with sizing. 
Uh, it used to be that it's too long. You can I fixed that with sizing. Uh, the, uh, the other things I had is that the bib falls apart because of abrasion on the bike. So usually when most customers, when they have the bibs that just don't last, uh, they have a saddle bag or saddle that's, you know, some of the saddle bags are quite big. Then they have an abrasive surface. Mm. So when you're rubbing up against it, especially once it's Velcro, then it Velcro's exposed. Rub, 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 rub. It's going to rub away your Lycra. Mm. Yeah, so I have that. But usually when it happens, what I do is I normally just send them a free bib. And oh, that's I nice. Yeah, I think I, I try to... Oh, yeah, so I, I always... Uh, when I treat customers come to me, come to me, I always try to make them happy within reason. So, of course, if it's an unreasonable customer and nothing I'm going to do is going to make them happy, I, uh, of course, I have to fall back on my policies, right? Mm. But more often now, if, if I know that a customer is genuinely having trouble and they, are, and they need help, I will do, I'll go, I'll go on, out of my way to help them. So, out of my way to help them is like, normally, I will ask for a photo of the bike. Then I will usually, if it's like that, I will identify, yeah, yeah, that's causing the issue. Mm. You need to, usually with a saddlebag, you just take duct tape and you tape the edges. Then mm. it smoothens it up and you don't get a problem anymore. Right. Or sometimes I've, I've dealt customers with fit issues uh, and I do like a, like a bike fit for them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, via WhatsApp. <laughs> 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 I mean, they're very, very easy things. Like uh, usually the most common thing is that the saddle's too high. Mm. And they don't know it, right? And the easy way they found it is you just put them on a bike and then you just look at how the hips are rocking. And if your hips are rocking a little bit side to side, yeah, it's too high. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yuva, thank you so much You're for most sharing about your bibs, the company, yeah. and about yourself. Uh, by the way, his interview is uh, somewhere buried in YouTube. Can uh, always catch it? Yeah, I think it's December last year. Yeah. We did it, right? So it now we are in January uh, yeah, 2023. So uh, more than a year. Yeah, more yeah. than a year. Uh, Yuva, everybody from Red White. Cheers guys. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>